This is lecture 24, chapter six. This will be the final lecture for, chap for chapter six, and this deals with machines. So up to this point, we've talked about trusses and frames, and the last category are machines. And what you'll find is that uh, machines use all the uh, basic uh, calculations and formulas that we've used up to this point, and they're just a little bit different application of what we already know. Now, essentially a machine is something that can transmit or modify forces. So if you have uh, something, uh, hand tools are a good example because oftentimes if you're trying to get a mechanical advantage by cutting a wire or using a pair of pliers to hold something, you can't impart the same force uh, with your fingers as you can with a pair of pliers. And so and it all comes down to leverage and using moment arms to, to uh, create this extra force that you are, that you're able to apply to something. And so there's really no free lunch per se because uh, you still have, are bound by the work, conservation of work. And so your force times distance is still the uh, same. So for example, if you're on a bicycle and you start pedaling uh, and you're pedaling at a lower gear, it might be easier to pedal, but your legs have to go around more often. And so, and so you don't go as far for each rotation, whereas in a higher gear you do. And so the net effect is that the work is the same, whether you're doing a low gear or high gear, it's just uh, how you how you perceive it and how the force is distributed. So, as I said, there's not a really a lot new in this chapter in terms of applications. There's just a few examples that I wanna go through and to show you specifics of mechanical advantage. And so the first one, a pair of uh, bolt cutters. And these bolt cutters are, it's pretty standard. You can purchase them anywhere. They're uh, fairly inexpensive, but, uh, the thing about the bolt cutters, it's a little different than say your standard pair of diagonal cutters or wire cutters is that they uh, use a double uh, can cantilever or a double moment in order to impart a very, very large force. And so we can see this when we do our calculation. So in this, in this case, we have a 300 Newton force applied to each part of the handle and we have a hexagonal bolt in the jaws that we're trying to cut. Now keep in mind that uh, when we're cutting it, uh, we also have the advantage of a, a sharp, sharp blade that's going to uh, impart a much higher stress because of the force over area. And so that's what gives us the ultimate ability to cut. So let's go ahead and look at this, uh, this example. So here we have our bolt cutters. And what I've done is I've drawn the two the, the first piece that's integral, and that's the handle. And so you'll notice that within the bolt cutters, you have these two, these three pivot points here, and I've drawn the top part, which is this, which is here. So we have this point here, the common point, which is C, and then this point up here, which is B. Now, when we look at this, it looks kind of like a prehistoric fish, but uh, you have your 300 Newtons applied here and distance wise from C is 448 millimeters. And the distance from B to C is 12 millimeters. And so what we're really looking for is how do we calculate the downward force created by the 300 Newton force at B. And the reason we, we uh, wanna know that is because then if we look at the the actual uh, cutting part or the head, this part here, then we'll do the same thing. We'll take the force in uh, B and we'll use that to figure out this ultimate force F that's being imparted. So you can look at both of these as almost like two levers or two seesaws. The, one, the first one here, essentially has the fulcrum at C, and B is your force. And so in this case, it would be B goes down and 300 goes down, just like that. 
And that's the same things we're seeing here. Now, I, we, you may ask, well, what about the horizontal forces? Well, it turns out because if you look at the system, there are no horizontal forces applied, then the horizontal forces here, whatever they are, are gonna be equal and opposite, and they should be zero because there's no applied force in, this, um, in that direction. So what we can do first is calculate what is, if we take a moment about C, what is the force on B? And so this is just a simple ratio. We have 300 um, newtons, and that's going to be multiplied by the distance. So if we have 300 newtons, and you could also write it as summing the moments about C if you want, but it, it's easy to see that this, this force times distance has to be equal to this force times distance. So 300 newtons times 448 millimeters has to be equal to BY times 12 millimeters. And so that gives us a BY value of 11,200 newtons. So a fair amount of increase. So we take that amount and we come down to here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. Uh, we can ignore BX and we're going to use A as our fulcrum point. Now you'll notice that on the actual uh, bolt cutters that this plate here at A and D the purpose of that plate is to prevent the jaws from separating. So if you ever used a dull pair of scissors, and you try to cut paper with it, the paper slides between the jaws. And that's what you want to avoid if you're trying to cut something really hard with a pair of bolt cutters. So this A and D link here basically keeps the jaws in plane. So if we go ahead and do the same thing down here, well, we can see that it's going to be set up the same, but the ratio 96 to 24 is basically a four to one ratio. So with that, we know that B times four equals F times one. And so that's basically four times that gives us a four. So that force ends up being 44,800 newtons, which is about 10,000 pounds. So it's a fair amount of force created. Now, the, uh, if you've ever used bolt cutters, you know that in order to impart that force, the uh, amount of movement that you have to do on the actual handles is quite wide. So when you open the handles, you end up with something that looks like this in the handles, but the amount that the blades open is very, very small. So you may only get a few millimeters of travel, maybe a centimeter of travel here for this huge travel here. And that's what I was talking about is force times distance and force times distance have to be equal to one another because work must be conserved. Okay, so that's one example. Let's go ahead and do another one. Now, in this example, we have a uh, block, uh, a clamp. So if you're trying to hold wood, say, in a, in a um, in location while you cut it, uh, do something to it, uh, perhaps you have uh, this type of uh, toggle clamp that when you push down will lock the wood into place. So in this problem, what we want to figure out is what is the actual uh, force at E that's pushing back on BD. And so uh, we know we have a 100 pound force that's uh, reacted, that, I'm sorry, that's applied at C. A is given as four inches, which I'll put my problem. So A is a four inch length. And then we know from looking at that BD is going to be a two force member. So we know the direction of its force. And so what we're gonna wanna do is figure out what is essentially the X component of BD, because we know whatever that X component is, is gonna to have to be equal and opposite to E. So here we have our block. And as I was saying, is if we wanna think about how this is pushing, we know that the link, 
So if we have, if we were to say separate this out, so this is our little uh, block at the end, and then there is block E, and then here's our wall. So we know that E imparts a push on the wall. The wall pushes back. We know that this little end here pushes on E and E pushes back. So it's gonna look something like that and something like that. And then the BD is going to be pushing up. So the end of this link is gonna have this BD in the X direction and it's gonna push against that part going to push back, that's going to push against E, which is going to push back, E is going to push against the wall, wall is going to push back. So that's the projection or aggression of the force. So we want this value. Now, so you can kind of see where this is going to go. If we sum the moment about A, then we will be able to find this component of BD because we know it's a two-force number, we know which direction it is. But first we need to figure out what's what. Now this is four inches here, this is six inches here. We're given this is 15 degrees. So we can calculate this height, BE, from four sine 15. So we know that it's gonna be 1.035 inches. So then what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna to wanna to figure out what is this angle right here. And so I'll just call that angle beta. So we wanna know what is that angle beta right there. So now that we know this height, we can find that out. We know that sine of beta is going to be the ratio of the opposite side. So 1.03528, kept a little few extra digits there. And then that's going to be divided by 6. And that gives us a beta equal to 9.93. Five nine degrees. So even though it looks like it, these two angles are not the same. So this angle here is that. So now we can now we can figure out what is the distance um, from A to D because we're going to want to know that when we sum the moment about A. We're going to want to know uh, how far this point is. So it turns out that if we were to call, we call this point E, we know that uh, this distance A E is going to equal four cosine 15 degrees. And one thing I just realized, I apologize, is I was using E here, which is really poor because this is E over here. So I changed that to F. So I went back and I did this BF. So this distance, um, this height BF is here, 1.035. This distance A to F is simply four cosine 15. This distance from F to E is six cosine 9.359. So we get those respective values. We get a total distance of 9.7737 inches. Now the reason we care about that is that when we look at BD, like this, that we know that when, if this is D right here, that it's gonna have a component that does this, and a component that does that, right? And so when we sum the moments at A, if we go to this point here, then this X component is gonna disappear and we're left just with that. Now, it doesn't mean we can't calculate the X component, it just means it won't be take part in our moment about A. And so it makes things just a hair easier when we're looking at this. So when I set up my equation, then I'm going to sum the moment about A to zero, which is going to be minus 100 pounds, it's clockwise, and that's going to be times 10 inches cosine 15 degrees. And so that gives me basically this distance to where that force is being put down. 
and then that's going to be plus. Now this is going to be BD. Now we want the just the vertical component of BD. And so we're assuming that um, it's going to be, even though I've drawn it this way, that we're really thinking of it as going up. So I drew it that way to demonstrate what I was doing, but let's just say that we know it's going this way and that way. There's D. So we don't care about this part, we only care about that part. Well, that part is going to be then BD sine of that angle that we found, theta. So 9.9359 degrees, and then multiplied by that distance, 9.7737 inches. And all that equals zero. Sorry, it's getting a little messy. So again, you have the 100 pounds times 10 inches cosine 15, and that's going to be opposed by this component of BD going up, and the other one, of course, will be going that way. But we only care about that one, and its distance is going to be this distance AE, which is right here. This is AE. So we get a value of BD equal to 573 pounds. And so if we want to know what BDX is, because remember we've already established that BDX is going to give us this, then, sorry, one more quick, we've already established that BDX uh, will give us this component, of course, going that way. And so um, now remember that uh, we did draw this in compression. Right, so th which makes sense mechanically, this is going to be in compression. Uh, but when you think about the actual force imparted, it's going to be pushing against BDX. So, it, so it, it's consistent in the way that the the two uh, two force member uh, exists in the system that it will be compressing the block and therefore pushing E to the right. It wouldn't make any sense if it went the other way. So we have our hundred pounds accounted for the moment and so now we just need to find the BDX. So we know BDX in this case is just going to be equal to BD times the cosine of beta up here. So 9.9359 degrees and so we end up with if we plug in 573 into there we end up with BDX which equals E, which equals 564 pounds. And there we have it. So you see that the, the difficulty here, it's, it's not any different than, than other problems we've done. It uses the same tools. We're not gonna do 3D machines or 3D frames. So this is as hard as it gets. All right, hopefully that made sense. Clear on that. And make sure actually that's all right. So we did that problem. All right. And so we'll do this one now. Walk you through this problem. So this one's a little different. This one again, uh, and there's kind of a theme to this is there's a lot more having to do with the actual geometry, which actually makes the problem a little more challenging than the actual uh, statics, statics aspect. So if we look at this problem, here we have a 100 newton force being applied. And as you can see that BD is a two force member again, it's going to press C through this um, cylinder. The cylinder is going to push through the hole in the, in the bracket. And then Q is going to be opposing it. So you want to know what magnitude of Q is such that this 100 Newton force will not cause CE to slide. And so, of course, we assume there's no friction since we haven't dealt with it yet. Now, in this case, beta is 20 degrees. So we know beta is 20 degrees. That's a given. Um, and we also know that BD is 250 millimeters. And I apologize for that up here in the problem statement. 
So BD is 250 millimeters, beta is 20 degrees. We know that distance is 200, that distance is 150, and we know the height is 35. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this problem. Okay, so here's the drawing of it. We know we have the 100 newtons up here. We know that's 150. We know that this is 200. We know that's 250, as I said, and we know it's 20 degrees. So um, this distance here is just the cosine of 200 times, cosine 20 degrees times 200, that gives us that. And if we want the total distance FC, that's just the total 350 times cosine 20, and that gives us that. So we probably will be needing these. And then this height, BG, is given as 200 sine 20, so it's that height there. Now. The reason we need to know that is because uh, we know that BD is a two-force member. So summing the moments about B isn't going to help us because we're going to have then CX and CY down here. So we'll have too many unknowns. So because BD is, uh, we know the direction of it, we're going to want to sum the moments about C, and then we can solve for BD. Once we know that, we can sum forces to figure out what component of CX is in the system, and that will be then equivalent to our Q. But we know that 35 millimeters goes up to D, and we know that this height B that runs basically from here over to here, and this is a little triangle I made here, it shows you that BD is 250 millimeters, and this little angle omega is that little angle that runs here straight across. And so to calculate that, um, we know that this total height is 68.4, right? Because we found that here, BG. And we subtract the known 35, and we know that this is 33.4. So the reason that's important is then we're going to use that to break our BD into X and Y components. So if we want to figure out this omega, we just say inverse sine of 33.4 over 250. And once we have that, we get this little angle, it's only 7.679 degrees, all right? Okay, so we have that. So then we're gonna go ahead, and we're gonna say, well, let's sum the moments about C, zero. So hopefully you followed all that. That was a quick geometry. If not, I would pause it and look and see where I got those numbers from. But again, at this point, this stuff should be second nature to you. So we got the, some of the notes about C. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that uh, BD, we're going to break that up into its X and Y components. So we know that BD Y equals BD sine of 7.679 degrees, and BD X equals BD times cosine, 7.679 degrees. Now you could have squared, squared, you could have squared this and subtracted the square of that to get that side, and you could use triangle ratios here, and that would have worked the system well too. So now we know BD, we're going to assume that this member is compressed, which makes sense. So what we're going to have here back at B when we're doing some of our moments is we're going to have a force that is going to be going up and one that's going to be going that way, right? Because we're going to sum about C. So that means that we're going to have the horizontal support of BD is going to be doing counterclockwise moment, whereas the vertical component of BD is going to be doing a clockwise moment. And then, of course, the 100 newtons is a counterclockwise moment. All right. So we'll go ahead and set that up. We have BD sine 7.679, and then it's times its vertical distance, or perpendicular distance, which is the 187. 
I found here. So that's this times that distance. So then it's going to be this times that distance, right? That's going to be um, my that's going to be my clockwise version. So let me see. So we're going to have that. So we have our clockwise BD sine 769 with the negative, and then we have plus our BD cosine 7.679 degrees times 68.4, and then plus 100 times the total distance of 328.9, I'll equal zero. All right, so that whole distance there. So I end up actually with a negative, and because uh, initially I, I thought, well, maybe it's compression, but it's not, it's actually tension. So these, so BD is a negative 771. So what it's really saying is that BD is, these aren't pointing this way, they're pointing the other way. So they're actually pointing that way. So it's kind of like this BD is going like that and like that, all right? So with that, um, knowing that, that's what's important because now we know that BD going in that direction is the, is what we want. Um, in order to calculate C. And that makes sense because if C, if B is going that way, then C would be going that way, which would make any sense because Q already says it's going that way. So what we're gonna find is that BD is going to find, going to go in direction here. So the good thing is we only really care about the magnitude. So what we've established is that <clears throat> we know that Q is going that way. And that, and so another way to look at it is Q goes that way. And that means that CX has to push that way. Um, but then that means that this bar is connected. This bar here has to go the other way. All right. So if you, if you look at the directions of the forces and you look at actually everything, they're not, you really know that ultimately Q has to be the same magnitude as CX and that's all you really care about, but it's good to go back and look at the, how the forces actually uh, interact. So when you think about you're pushing this down, so if you push the 100 newtons down, it's gonna wanna push the Q this way. And so uh, this BD member is then likely, it's going to be in tension because you're pulling it. At least that's how I see it. And then, so as a result, this is gonna point that way. So anyway, so that's, you know, Seeing that mechanical advantage does help, but in this problem, it's just about getting that X component. But the more you understand physically what's going on, the better off you'll be solving these things and they get a little more abstract. So anyway, so we know that CX is just gonna to equal to whatever BD is, which is 771, and then it's gonna be times the cosine of that little angle, 7.679 degrees. Um, and so that equals 764, because ultimately, so 764 newtons, that equals Q. Because ultimately, we know that the only X component, the only X force here besides C is BD. So whatever that magnitude is has to be equal and opposite here. And so I would encourage you if that is, I know I went through that kind of quick and said several things, and I might have backtracked a little on a couple, but what I would say is go through the problem yourself and uh, make sure it makes sense to you. And the way is go ahead and do my steps. Um, go 
going through a little quicker just because the uh, map itself is very simple. But conceptually, you want to make sure you understand what's going where. So kind of as a recap, we have the 100 newtons here. And as far as C goes, that's going to want to make a clockwise moment. So then we think about B, D, and we think of, well, which force is going to make the bigger moment? It's going to be the Y component. So it makes sense that if this is going counterclockwise, that the Y component is going to need to go clockwise in order to make a, um, and then the, so that's going that way. That's going that way, and that's also going that way. So the combination. So again, don't don't get too tripped up in it. Uh, try to try to keep it separate each one, and then just ultimately work through until you get to the end. So one quick note: <clears throat> another way to look at it is if this is C, because and I'm doing this because I don't feel like I've explained this as well as I could have. And it's hard to backtrack, and I don't want to have to edit this video. So uh, if you think about this member here, then if you look at just this, because we think of this, this two-force member acting on this, then in terms of how this acts on this, its force is up and to the left. But when we go back to this component, it's going to be equal and opposite. Or when we put them together, they're opposite one another and they cancel. So that's why when we start with the moment, we treat it this way. But when we go back to solving for it, uh, in terms of uh, to find this component here, where I say it goes over into the right. So ultimately, that's why C, the C component points to the left, but that's in relation to this rod here. So another way to think about it is that this is going to go that way here, but then on the rod, it's going to go that way there. This end rod is going to push that way, and Q is going to push that way. OK. All right, I hope, I hope that makes sense. I beat that one to death. All right, one last one, uh, and this one's a little different than the others. I think you got the hang of these types. These are mostly, we walked through right in your book and they're what they know what the book looks like. Um, but this one I got out of another source. And I like it because uh, it shows how mechanical advantage is used for practical. Um, and that's Belwo, not Bellwells. You know, it sounds like Elmer Flood, but no, it's supposed to be below. So here we have a, a uh, um, scale, and the scale uses a small mechanical advantage in order to use a very, very small weight in order to balance a much, much larger weight. So in this case, we have a 25 gram mass here, and we have four kilograms here. And so we know in, in order to and this is calibrated so that when you slide the mass across, when this is exactly 4.00 kilograms, this would be calibrated so that it would tell me that that's four kilograms. And it's no different than the beam balance uh, old types of scales that the doctor's office, they use a small, um, the small beam balance and you, you uh, or beam balance is used in high school if you guys didn't have digital scales. So the idea with this one is we want to figure out what is this x distance. So where does this 25 grams have to be such that it, uh, it, it uh, is in equilibrium and it balances this four kilograms. So if you look at it for a second, and I would encourage you to take a look before you look at my solution and just think of how you do this problem. And if you look at it enough, you can, and you should be able to see it um, depending on your experience, but I would highly encourage you to, to do that because if you can solve this without my solution, then it shows you have a pretty good fundamental understanding of mechanics and how this stuff works. So try that, and when you're ready, uh, restart the video and look at the solution. OK. 
Okay, so you figured it out that you want to see. So here's the drawing. So it's a, it's a, if you think about it, it's a system, it's a, a series of cantilevers or moments. Now, if we start off here, we have A, we know we have the four kilograms hanging here. So we know that this, whatever this upward force is here, DE, is, has to be balanced by the four kilograms. So we can set it up like that. We know four kilograms down, we know D going up, some moment about A, we have this simple relationship. Um, four times 50 has to be D times the total distance, 375. So we get D equal to five, or half a kilogram, effectively. So when the D goes up, that means E comes down, they're the same. So we can then do the same thing. We can draw this cantilever here, knowing that the downward force is the same as this upward force here. So we put that there, and here's C. That's our fulcrum point. So we're gonna sum our moments or balance about that. So that'll allow us to find F. So we do that, and we find that F is 0.133 kilograms. So now we know that, and I didn't, I could have converted it to Newtons, but it really doesn't matter because it's a constant. Um, and, and so we're just looking at the relative differences. And so we have this 0.133 kilogram mass force, if you want to call it, going down. That means that the upward force here has to be the same. So now what I can do is I can find where I need to put this 25 grams so that it balances that upward force. So if I do that, I set it up like this, where I know that G is going up, the 0.025 is going down. And so I know that the total distance to the end is 825. I know this distance here is my little x, so I want eight minus x. So G times 100, because that's where that is, has to equal this 0.025 times 825 minus x. So I go ahead and put in G, 0.133 kilograms or um, equal times 100 equals this many kilograms times 825 and then minus so all I did was distribute the 0.025 and then I end up solving and I get x is 291.67 millimeters from the end. So if I want to double check that because I found um, so what I actually, what I, yeah, what I found was I solved for X here, but what I could do is I could take this and subtract it from 825 and I could plug it in here and I could show that 825 minus that would be this distance here. That's going to balance. And that's it. That's all you need to do. So interesting problem just uh, uses, again, force uh, enhancement through mechanical advantage. And that's pretty much it for machines. That's all there is. So in the next lecture, we're going to talk about friction. And we'll culminate that with uh, either two, maybe three lectures, probably just two, uh, show you the basic points of friction. And by no means will we cover anywhere near much friction. But I just want to get enough so that you understand it to the final. And you guys will pick that up again in dynamics. All right, thank you. Have a good day.